Hey everybody, so this channel has been called Andre Shelf for I think three or four years now and originally I called it that because I wanted to talk about stuff on my shelf and I wanted to have basically an excuse to make videos about movies and anime and manga but I recently realized that I haven't done an actual like shelf tour in like two or three years so I think it's finally time to update you guys all on what the shelf looks like now. So this is probably gonna be the longest shelf tour video I've done. So sit back, relax, maybe grab a snack and a drink, put this on two times speed, or just leave this on as a podcast because this is gonna go on for a while. But first, let's just do a quick little tour of how this shelf is now organized. So at the top there, we have just a bunch of random uh, knickknacks and figures and stuff. Uh, and then we have my Blu-ray shelf. These are anime Blu-rays mainly, but I also have some film Blu-rays, Switch games, CDs, and then we have my manga. Um, the manga is gonna look very unorganized. It's not like alphabetical or anything. It's just kind of wherever things fit. My collection is not large enough that this would be an issue where I would like not be able to find things. So I'm fine with it being kind of disorganized. It's not in any particular order. So uh, if that bothers you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we have my manga. Some of it is in Japanese, some of it is in English. Uh, we have my One Piece stuff there. And then my art books on these two bottom shelves. But I also have some manga down there as well. Some more manga. And then these are like the display shelves. So as you can see, I have two sound euphonium shelves. I think a good amount of my recent audience is into sound euphonium, so you can look forward to me talking about these shelves. And then I have my Tatsuki Fujimoto Chainsaw Man shelf, and then my Bochi the Rock shelf. So we're gonna go from top to bottom, and then from bottom all the way to top. So without any further ado, let's start up at this shelf. So this is my top shelf up here with all my figures. Obviously, I'm not a huge figure collector, but we do have some One Piece stuff. I got a Zoro right here, got a Luffy up there, um, and then we have a Goku back there, and then some more One Piece stuff. We got these uh, capsule machines, these mini capsule machines. They actually have little capsule in them, um, and these capsule machines themselves came in like a capsule, a gachapon capsule that came from a, gaps, a Gachapon <laughs> capsule machine. So it's like Gachapon capsule inception. Um, but yeah, these actually were a gift. These capsule machines, that Luffy figure and the Zoro figure were all gifts from my uh, Japanese teacher when I was a kid. So yeah, pretty cool. And I kept them ever since. Also a gift from my friend. I got th these uh, One Piece rubber chickens, got Luffy, over there and a chopper over there. And then we have my pudding figure uh, from Whole Cake Island, that arc of One Piece. Speaking of One Piece, we got the box set back here. I think this is box set two, two or three. Um, this is an empty box though. My volumes are in the shelf below. Uh, same thing I can say for the Steel Ball Run box right here. Empty box, but the uh, volumes are down in my shelf below. We'll get to that later. Up at the front here, we have a little display of a fight between Tao Pai Pai and Jet Jaguar from my favorite, one of my favorite Godzilla movies, which is uh, Godzilla vs. Megalon. Tao Pai Pai, one of my favorite characters from Dragon Ball. Let's see, we have these random little trinkets. I got from Japan. And I have my sound euphonium cap up here, but we'll get to, again, we'll get to the sound euphonium stuff a little later. Uh, and yeah, uh, we also have some pins in the background here. They're in like a little plastic case. And we also have these Gundams. Um, but yeah, anyway, that is the top shelf. Let's move on down to this shelf, which is basically all my Blu-rays, uh, starting with anime. And then on the other side, we have some non-anime, but yeah, starting over here, we got Spirited Away and My Neighbor Totoro. These are the G-Kids uh, Collector's Edition uh, Blu-ray sets. Uh, G-Kids, they only made like three of these Collector's Edition 
sets for uh, the, G the Ghibli movies. They did Spirited Away, My Neighbor Totoro, and they also have a Princess Mononoke one. But uh, for some reason they stopped. I guess maybe people weren't buying them? But I don't know, I kind of like these. They're kind of weirdly weird dimensions, right? They, they stick out of the shelf. I don't know, I think they look really nice. But yeah, Spirited Away and My Neighbor Totoro are probably my favorite Studio Ghibli movies. Uh, some of my favorite films of all time, not just including anime, including all types of film. Really, really love Ghibli and Hayao Miyazaki and stuff. Uh, but yeah, moving on, we have Attack on Titan, Season 1, Season 2, Season 3 Part 1, Season 3 Part 2, and the Final Season Part 1, and the Final Season Part 2. Excited to eventually complete the collection. Attack on Titan is such a good series. Uh, it's one of those shonen action manga anime adaptations uh, that I think really does live up to the hype. It's so well written, uh, but also it's very divisive, especially the final season. <laughs> but uh, I find that a lot of the times um, when something, when a piece of art is really divisive, that's when I have the strongest feelings about it. But anyway, since this is here, might as well point it out. This is a little Dungeon Meshi keychain I got from FanimeCon. I really enjoyed Dungeon Meshi this past season, uh, and I'm excited that it's getting, it's already con confirmed, getting a second season. That's awesome. Okay, and then we have The Boy and the Heron, which is a movie that I watched four times in theaters because uh, I really, really liked it and uh, was really moved by it. And I just wanted to savor the feeling of going to a new Studio Ghibli Hayao Miyazaki film in its initial theater run. I had never experienced seeing a brand new Hayao Miyazaki film in theaters before. So this was a very special experience for me. And I think the movie is fantastic. It's a masterpiece. It's one of my favorite of Hayao Miyazaki's films. And yeah, it's one of the best movies I've seen in a long time. <laughs> Next up, we have Jihaya Furu, seasons one, two, and three. Uh, really, really, really freaking great uh, slice of life sports drama. Uh, if you like Hibike Euphonium, you should watch Jihaya Furu if you haven't. The one downside uh, about Jihaya Furu, I will say, is that it's three seasons, 25 episodes each, 75 episodes total, and the anime only covers half the manga. It's been five years, I think, since season three aired, and we have not heard a peep about season four. So I'm thinking it's not happening, um, and that makes me very sad. So it's an incomplete anime, at least at the moment, but Despite that, I do think it's it's one of my favorite anime of all time. Uh, and if you like Hibika Euphonium, definitely check out Chihaya Furu. It's also pretty unique in terms of sports anime, obviously because, the, for one thing, the sport Karuta is a very niche Japanese sport. But I think a kind of a cool thing about Karuta as a sport is that it attracts people of all ages, and there's no, like gender separations in tournaments. So you can have guys matched against girls, guys and girls on the same team. And on top of that, it's also, when they do tournaments, there's people of all, literally all ages that they face off against, which is really interesting. Uh, again, I think that's kind of different from a lot of sports anime. Uh, but yeah, Chihai Fudu, really, really freaking good show. So that's season one. Season 2 and Season 3. Next up we have Children of the Sea. So this is a movie I watched, uh, I think, I actually have, yes, I have my ticket. This is the uh, first movie that I ever watched in a theater in Japan, back when I went to Japan in 2019 for the first time. Uh, cool experience, I will say. Gen uh, to be honest, I fell asleep during the movie. Uh, this is a pretty dense movie in terms of dialogue and exposition, but what's awesome about this movie is the visuals. It is a freaking stunning movie. It's one of the most beautiful animated films, or just films in general, that I've ever seen. Uh, so I think it's 
more than worth watching just for the visuals alone. Uh, but I will say the story is can the story can get a little convoluted and um, very very expositiony. <laughs> Next up we have Cowboy Bebop: The Complete Series, right here. Uh, funny thing about this Blu-ray, this is one of the first Blu-rays I ever bought, and then later on I decided that oh I don't really like Cowboy Be Cowboy Bebop that much, so I ended up selling the Blu-ray. And then right before the Netflix Cowboy Bebop came out, I decided to rewatch the series. The anime series and I realized oh wait no I actually really like Cowboy Bebop so I repurchased the same blu-ray but yeah Cowboy Bebop great series I think some people on the internet like newer anime fans who try Cowboy Bebop and don't like it I think a lot of them go into it with the wrong expectations it's not like a super plot driven show it's an episodic show uh, and it's mostly character driven and it's mostly vibes, to be honest. There is kind of an overarching plot and overarching character arcs, but they don't really like get addressed that much uh, until like certain specific points in the show and obviously at the end of the show. Uh, but for the most part, it's just vibes. It's cool. It's fun. The characters are great. Uh, the only issue I have with this show is that it's too short. It's only 26 or 25 episodes and uh, I wish it was more. Next up we have Death Note, another classic. This one's from the 2000s, everybody knows Death Note. Um, this was like the first quote-unquote serious anime or manga I ever watched before that I was watching friggin Naruto and, and One Piece and stuff. Uh, so this is the first like mature show I ever watched even though it's technically it's in the same magazine as One Piece and Naruto. The first half of Death Note is really 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 good second half is not as good i don't think it's bad i just feel like you know they made a big decision halfway through the series and it feels like they kind of spent the rest of the series trying to make up for that decision realizing too late that that was not the best decision for the story uh but for what it was i think they did a pretty decent job all right next up we have the Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya, the movie. A uh, classic film from the 2000s. I was I was really into Haruhi back in like the early 2010s. I feel like it's kind of a hard series to pitch to people today, but it was such an iconic series back in the day. Obviously Kyoto Animation. This was Kyoto Animation uh, at a kind of a different time. I know a lot of people are like begging for Haruhi season three from Kyoto Animation, but I just feel like it's not going to be the same. Kyoto Animation, just as a company, their culture, and the type of anime they make nowadays, it's like very different from what it was when they were making stuff like Haruhi Suzumiya and Lucky Star and Clannad and all that. Uh, I feel like it just wouldn't be the same. And I personally think The Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya is a perfect finale for the show. I know there's more light novels and there's like an actual conclusion in the light novel series, but I like this movie as the conclusion to the anime. All right, moving on, we have Fooly Cooly, another classic from the 2000s. Uh, yeah, this is a weird show. And I think beyond like the wild, crazy, bizarreness, wackiness of the series, it's actually really well written. Like the characters are really well written. The dialogue is great. It's funny, but it's also a really well done coming of age story. And that's what I appreciate about it. It's super weird and crazy. And yet there's a heart to it. It's not just wild and crazy for no reason. Uh, and I think it's sometimes kind of characterized as that. Next up, Full Metal Alchemist. Uh, this is the original 2003 series. I don't have Brotherhood. Um, because this might be blasphemous to say, but back when I watched this, probably in like 2016 or 17, I watched the original series first, and then I watched Brotherhood, and I kind of came out liking the original series more. I kind of liked the weirder direction that the original series went with the story and the world and the characters. I, do, I mean, I appreciate Brotherhood expanding the world building and stuff, uh, and obviously respect uh, Hiromu Arakawa's original vision, but I just think the anime, the original 2003 anime, took it in a really unexpected direction that I kind of appreciate. Maybe if I rewatch it, 
like Brotherhood and the original series again today, I would have a different opinion. Uh, but you know, at the time that I bought this Blu-ray, I did like Full Metal Alchemist 2003 a lot and Brotherhood a lot as well, but not as much. Next up, we have the Galaxy Express 3.9, the movie, which is one of the older things I have on the shelf. This is from 1979, I believe. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of, how do I explain this? It's kind of Ghost in the Shell meets Blade Runner meets uh, Castle in the Sky meets Steven Universe in a way. It's an awesome movie. Next up, we have Ghost in the Shell. So this is the original 1995 film. You know, whenever I watch anime films from this era, the 90s, and even before then, I'm always so taken aback by the level of draftsmanship, not just in like the character drawings, but in the background paintings. They're so stunning to look at because you know these are like hand-drawn on paper, the actual characters, and the backgrounds are hand-painted on paper. It's so mind-blowing to look at these movies. Uh, but yeah, Ghost in the Shell is also just a pretty cool movie story-wise as well. It's very philosophical, but there's also a good amount of action and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's a classic for a reason. Next up is Hanasaka Iroha. We have volumes one and two. Uh, it's split into two Blu-ray sets, but it's just one 26 episode anime series. This is one of my favorite slice of life dramas of all time. Ne next to Chihai Furu and Hibike Euphonium. Again, if you liked Hibike Euphonium, I think you would like Hanasaka Iroha. I feel like people don't talk about Hanasaka Iroha. This is one of the earlier PA Works shows. It's really well written. It's written by Mario Okada, who for me is kind of hit or miss, but this is definitely one of her hits. It's about a girl who basically gets abandoned by her kind of irresponsible mom and gets sent off to the inn that her grandmother uh, ma is the manager and owner of. And she's sent there not just to live and have a roof over her head, but also to work as a waitress at this at this inn. Uh, and it's a really great coming of age story. Again, if you like San Euphonium, I think you would really love Hanasaka Iroha. Just like San Euphonium, Hanasaka Iroha has a really great sense of like the location and the place that it's set in. And one of my favorite things about Hanasaka Iroha is because it's a complete story from episodes 1 to episode 26, they spend a good amount of time developing each character so they all feel like human beings and then by the end of the story it's very bittersweet because you get to really appreciate these characters and the world and the setting. It has one of my favorite endings to an anime ever. It's very satisfying but also bittersweet. Uh, yeah, Hanasaka Iroha, great. Great show. All right, so next up we have the Heike story or Heike Monogatari. This is a historical drama uh, produced by Science Saru and directed by Naoko Yamada of k and Tamako Market fame. And of course, she was also the series Enshutsu or I guess kind of like assistant director for Sound Euphonium seasons one and two. Obviously, I have a lot of respect for uh, Naoko Yamada. She, of course, also directed Liz and the Bluebird, which we'll talk about later in the video, of course. Um, but uh, the Heike story is actually the first TV series that she's directed since Tamako Market, which I believe was in 2014. Uh, so, and this came out in like 2021. So it was like, it's been like seven years since she directed a series. And usually, obviously, Naoko Yamada is known for directing shows about and movies about like high school age kids living in the modern day. So this is a very big departure for her and it's super interesting to watch. Uh, I will say this is not an easy <laughs> anime to watch as far as just like sitting back, relaxing, turning your brain off. There are so many characters in the show they have to keep track of. If you're not like intimately familiar with the Heike history, the actual like history of the Heike, of the real life Heike clan, you might get mixed up and like lose track of who's who and stuff. So I would recommend like keeping a Wikipedia tab open on another tab while you're watching this show. Uh, and some people will criticize the show for that, but 
I think it's a really cool, really interesting piece of entertainment and, you know, animation. I feel like it would work really well as like a supplemental material in like a Japanese history class. Next up we have Makia. This is the directorial debut of Mario Kara. She also wrote this movie. Uh, if you want to cry, if you want a good anime that will make you cry, watch Makia. It also kind of deals with similar themes to Freerin, uh, in that it's about a girl in a fantasy world who is of a race that doesn't age as nearly as quickly as humans, and what that means for when they have relationships with humans. All right, so next up we have My Hero Academia, seasons one, two, three, and four. Uh, there was a time when I was really into My Hero Academia. It was the first like shonen that I had gotten into in a long time. So I watched season one, two, and three. There's a particular episode in season three that I'm sure My Hero fans know what I'm talking about that made me cry. Really, really surprised me there. Season four was also good. Uh, but season five, I, I don't know. I couldn't really get into season five for some reason, particularly the second half of it. Um, and I'm not sure why. And then I tried watching season six and I was just so bored. I'm sorry. I completely fell off of My Hero Academia, but it was good while it lasted. <laughs> while my love for it lasted. First four seasons I think are great. Next up we have Only Yesterday, which is an underrated Studio Ghibli film directed by Isao Takahata. One of my favorite films from Isao Takahata. Uh, this is, uh, you know how a lot of movies kind of portray childhood as like very whimsical and like dreamlike and like if it was all sunshine and roses. This is a movie that says no. Childhood had some good moments, but it was a lot of trauma as well. <laughs> So uh, if you need a reminder that, you know what, maybe your life right now isn't so bad. Because guess what, remember when you were a kid, there was actually a ton of trauma and, and childhood actually kind of sucked sometimes. A lot of the time, really. Um, that's what uh, I think Only Yesterday is about. <laughs> uh, but uh, joking aside, it is a really genuinely super, super charming movie about a woman who's reminiscing about her childhood. Next up we have Penguin Highway, which is another movie that's kind of about childhood. This one is, I think, one of those movies that is kind of romanticizing childhood. This movie really blew me away when I first saw it in theaters, uh, but I recently rewatched it and it didn't hold up quite as well. I still think it's a good movie, uh, it's just not the masterpiece that I originally thought it was. Uh, but I will say, the one thing that did really, really freaking hold up is the music. The composer, Umitaro Abe, I think he's one of the best musical composers working in anime, and we don't talk about him for some reason. I love his work in Penguin Highway, but also in Drifting Home, which is uh, another movie by this studio, Studio Colorado. Next up we got Ponyo. This is another one of my favorite Miyazaki films. I kind of feel similarly to Ponyo as I do with My Neighbor Totoro. My Neighbor Totoro is better, it's a masterpiece. Ponyo is a very, very good kids film in its own right though. I also like that it's Miyazaki like experimenting with a different type of art style which is the only time he really does it in any of his feature length films anyway. Uh, but yeah, Ponyo, great movie. Next up we have Sunny Boy on the opposite end of the spectrum. So this came out I think 2021, same year as the Heike story. Wow! <laughs> I don't even know how to describe Sunny Boy. It's one of those anime where like everything that's happening is not supposed to necessarily be taken literally and a lot of it is metaphorical. It's very surreal. Like the Heike story, but for a very different reason, it's one of those shows that you cannot just sit back and relax to, at least on your first watch. You have to pay attention, pay close attention, and think about it. Uh, I would recommend not like binging it either. I would recommend like between each episode, give yourself some time to like decompress, think about what you just saw and and just take a minute, take, maybe take a day, maybe take a week before you jump into the next episode. Uh, but yeah, Sunny Boy's crazy. And then we have what is actually my oldest show here on my shelf, Speed Racer. Uh, I was a huge fan of this as a kid. You'll see later on in this video, I have a couple Mach 5 toys and stuff, 
But uh, yeah, Speed Racer, a lot of fun. This is the dub. By the way, I just want to say I r props to whoever designed this at Funimation because this Blu-ray is beautiful. But yeah, Speed Racer. I don't know how well this is aged. Today, this is from the 60s, uh, but it's very nostalgic for me. Spirited Away, we already talked about. Um, yeah, one of my favorite films of all time. Next, The Tale of the Princess Kaguya. Now, this might actually be my favorite Isao Takahata movie. I do love Only Yesterday, and I love The Tale of the Princess Kaguya. Really cool visual style. The only film uh, of Isao Takahata is that Johi Saishi worked on. So that's kind of interesting. And of course, it's also Isao Takahata's final film that he did before he passed away. So it's a bittersweet finale to his career, but it is a great, great finale. And finally, for my standard anime Blu-rays, we got Tamako Market, as I just talked about earlier with the Heike story. Naoko Yamada directed this after she did K-On!, I really love Tamako Market. If you want something that's just really sweet and wholesome and cute, high recommendation. Okay, so now we're moving into uh, my uh, limited edition <laughs> Blu-ray sets for anime. We covered the, the G-Kids one back there. Here's some more. So first up, this nondescript white box. I don't know if you can tell. If you, look, if you focus really close there, maybe you can make out 3.0 plus 1.11. Yes, this is uh, Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.11, Thrice Upon a Time. Limited edition Blu-ray from G Kids. It is very, very minimal. You can barely make out the text on the box. Uh, but yeah, great Blu-ray set. This is another one of my favorite films that I've seen in a long time alongside The Boy and the Heron. I, I feel like we're so lucky that we got not only a, a, a Hayao Miyazaki film in the last five years, but a Hideaki Anno Evangelion film in the last five years. That's crazy. And for my money, this is the best that Evangelion has ever been. But this movie totally blew me away. Um, it's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, finale to a long-running series ever um yeah i don't know what else to say about it i have a poster over here as well and again not just not just anime films this is one of the best films of the 2020s next up we have your line april this is the aniplex blu-ray set complete blu-ray set uh this is the only aniplex show that i own because man their blu-rays are freaking expensive and this is probably their cheapest Blu-ray, at least like if you count price per episode. Uh, this is the entire 26 episode series on one Blu-ray set, and I think I got it for like around $90, which is still pretty expensive, but definitely cheaper than most of their products. Uh, but yeah, love Your Line April. Uh, it kind of restored my faith in anime back in the day uh, when it came out in 2014. I was already like kind of getting tired of seasonal anime, and I think I probably saw a string of pretty poor, pretty bad ones. Uh, this was in high school. But then I discovered Your Line April, which was airing whatever season that was airing, uh, and it blew me away. And I also read the manga as well. Again, if you like drama, if you like slice of life, melodrama, make you cry a little bit. I mean, if you like sound euphonium, this would probably also be up your alley as well. And finally, uh, right next to the anime that restored my faith in the anime, we have the anime that saved anime back in 2013, I think, or 2012, Kill a Kill. So, uh, this is the UK Blu-ray because the Aniplex Blu-ray is so expensive. This was like basically half the price. Uh, I do need a Region B Blu-ray player in order to watch it though, but uh, that's something I can figure out when I need to. Uh, but yeah, Kill a Kill is an awesome show. It's probably my favorite trigger show. It's it's just all these genres packed into one. We got student council, evil student council. We got the transfer student. We got fan service. We got action, magical girl kind of. We got all these genres mashed into one. Uh, but it's actually like really freaking good, even though it's all these like kind of you know cliches packed into one. They kind of take it all the way to the max. And it's also kind of a homage to those anime. 
the, the classic anime that started those genres back in like the 80s and 90s uh yeah it's it's an awesome series and this is like the one one of the only shows where you can say the fan service is integral to the plot and the world building but uh yeah that's kill a kill all right so now let's move into my non-anime blu-rays uh we're gonna talk about cinema folks so look if you like anime you should like cinema and vice versa if you like cinema you should like anime because in the end, it's all cinema, it's all film, it's all kino, whatever you want to call it. So let's start off with what is often considered one of the greatest films ever made by so many people, frankly including me, that's why it's on my shelf, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And I'm going to be totally honest with you guys, the very first time I watched this movie, I was bored. <laughs> And I didn't really get what was so special about it. Uh, but when you kind of dig into the behind the scenes and like think about the fact that this movie came out in 1968, a year before we landed on the moon, it's kind of insane how ahead of its time this film was in depicting space travel and like uh, astronauts living in a space station and AI and video conferencing and all that. Every time I've seen it since that first time, I've gotten to appreciate it more and more. Next up, we have the Grand Budapest Hotel. Oops, this way. I don't know why it's the opposite direction, but the Grand Budapest Hotel is easily my favorite Wes Anderson movie. It's one of my favorite films of the 2010s. It's a great adventure movie. Uh, but it's also like, you know, it's very quirky, like what a lot of Wes Anderson movies. Uh, it tells a story within a story within a story. It has some of his best production design, and I think it's just, in general, his most fun uh, adventure movie. Next up, we have Better Luck Tomorrow. Well, actually, we have a pair of Asian American films that were super important to the history of Asian American cinema. We have Everything Everywhere All At Once, of course, that won the Oscar a couple years ago, and Better Luck Tomorrow, which came out in the very early 2000s. I forgot which exact year, uh, but this was directed by Justin Lin. Better Luck Tomorrow was one of the first Asian American films, to my knowledge, uh, that kind of tackled the model minority myth and how that model minority myth affects Asian American youth. So it depicts these kids in high school who are like A students uh, and they decide you know what we're kind of bored of just studying all the time why don't we get into petty crime so they start by just doing simple things small things like helping people cheat on tests uh, but then it kind of snowballs and snowballs and snowballs until they're doing drugs theft and eventually kind of spoilers but eventually it kind of it leads to at least one potential murder. Even though it's a very low budget film, it's a film with really interesting ideas. And then we have Everything Ever All At Once, which also technically is kind of a low budget film, uh, but obviously this is way more bombastic and way more uh, wild and wacky and weird and artsy, but also like stupid and silly. But it also has a heart. It has a beating heart inside. It's very emotional. It's just a very, very special movie. I have to tell you guys, when I was growing up, I was a huge fan of Indiana Jones, which we'll actually talk about in a second. Uh, but yeah, I grew up watching like Temple of Doom, so I knew Ki Hui Kwan since I was a kid. And I remember before anything about this movie had been announced or anything, I was like curious about like, oh, where has Ki Hui Kwan been these last couple of years? What is he doing? Is he, is he still acting? And I remember like looking up YouTube videos and there was like a couple videos where he did like these tiny appearances at these like small little conventions and then like just a couple months after i did that like that search the trailer for everything everywhere all at once came out and in the trailer it says ki hui kwan and i was like wait what so i was uh highly highly anticipating this movie even before even when just the original trailer came out and it just looked like a weird wacky movie that maybe like would make a couple million dollars at the box office but obviously that's kind of funny looking back on it because now it's a Best Picture winner. Michelle Yeoh won Best Actress. Ki Hui Kwan won Best Supporting Actor. This movie did huge numbers for A24 
and it was so successful at the Oscars and the entire movie awards uh, season. Obviously, this movie made a huge, huge impact on a lot of people, not just people like me who liked Temple of Doom back in the day or Asian Americans. Uh, a lot of people love this movie and for good reason. So uh, yeah, better luck tomorrow. Everything ever all at once. Two great Asian American films. Next up, we got in the Indiana Jones 4 movie collection. I like to only acknowledge the first three movies. Uh, I don't hate Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but it's a pretty mediocre film compared to the first three movies, which I think are basically masterpieces. It's obviously, some aspects of these movies, like particularly culturally, <laughs> have not aged that well. The depiction of uh, indigenous communities, of Indian culture, of, of Asian culture even in Temple of Doom, it's uh, not the best, to be honest. But what I love about these movies is the filmmaking and storytelling. It's so, so good. It's filmmaking at the highest level and creativity to the highest level. Uh, it's, you know, obviously these are directed by Steven Spielberg, I think at his peak. But yeah, I, I absolutely adore these movies. They're huge inspirations to me as a kid. They continue to be huge inspirations to me now. Uh, I think they've aged, again, <laughs> as far as the filmmaking and storytelling goes, they've aged so well. Uh, in com when you compare them to today's like action blockbusters. But yeah, Indiana Jones, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Temple of Doom, and The Last Crusade, which is my favorite, personally, has always been my favorite, uh, are, are incredible. And then we have The End of the Shelf, Kill Bill, Volume 1, and Volume 2. I was a huge fan of Quentin Tarantino for a little bit. Uh, I guess I still am, uh, but uh, Kill Bill, is easily one of my favorites. I actually like volume two more than volume one because I just love the dialogue more. I think it's more entertaining than just like the kind of pure action that Kill Bill volume one is. Uh, but they're both great and obviously they're considered one film, two parts of one film. Uh, but yeah, they're like, they're great action, comedy, revenge flicks. And uh, I think Kill Bill volume one has like an anime flashback scene that was that was done by production IG, so hey, anime fans. All right, let's move on to the next shelf. Okay, so this is shelf number two. We have kind of a bunch of random stuff here. So we have the rest of my movies, uh, starting with some anime, but these are, so these, the anime up here were all Blu-rays. Here we have A Spirited Way on VHS and Yakita to Japan on DVD. Uh, then we have my movies, games, CDs, and then the start of my manga collection. So let's go over here, starting with Spirited Away on VHS. Yes, I kept this from when I was a kid. Then we have Yagtari Japan, which is very nostalgic for me. This is a series about bread making, people who bake bread, but it's kind of a shonen competition-y kind of thing. It's like Shokugeki no Soma, but there's no fan service, well, there's very little fan service, and it's just about baking bread and pastries. If that sounds interesting to you, check it out. I will say though, this series massively jumps to shark in uh, the second half of the manga and like the last third of the anime or whatever. Uh, so I will say, if you are watching Yatari Japan right now and you've finished the Monaco Cup arc, whether it's in the anime or the manga, <laughs> you can stop there. Anyway. Moving on, we have The Room, uh, one of the greatest films of all time. Of course, we have it widescreen, can't do it any other way. And then we have the continuation of my Blu-rays. So we got Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, so another Quentin Tarantino film. This one has grown on me. The first time I watched it in theaters, I thought it was okay. I thought it was like a kind of a mid-Quentin Tarantino movie, which is still good. Um, but every time I've seen this movie afterwards, I've come to appreciate it and enjoy it even more. And now it's like one of my favorite Quentin Tarantino movies. It's a very chill movie to watch. Next up we have Pulp Fiction, which is kind of the original chill Quentin Tarantino movie that's just people talking and hanging out and stuff. I love Pulp Fiction as a basic male movie fan, but uh, it is a genuinely really, really fun movie. Next up we have Ringu, or just Ring, the original uh, Japanese horror film from Hideo Nakata. Uh, this is a really cool movie. 
I personally don't think it's that scary, especially since I've seen it twice now. I just like the vibe. I think it's perfect for like October, Halloween, spooky season. I think the, the ending is pretty hilarious. I don't know if it's intended to be hilarious, but I think it's pretty hilarious. Uh, but I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it. But yeah, Ringu, classic Japanese horror film from the 90s, I think? 1998, yeah. Then we have another more modern Japanese horror film. We have Shin Godzilla, which was obviously directed by Hideaki Anno, which is kind of crazy. And you can tell from like the shot composition and the way it's directed, it's very Hideaki Anno. It very, feels very Evangelion-y. Um, but yeah, this is a cool movie. Next up, we have Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, obviously the same director as 2001 A Space Odyssey, which I earlier just said was a masterpiece. The Shining is the horror movie that got me into horror movies. And as the uh, basic movie fan that I am, this is still my favorite horror movie of all time. I just like the vibe a lot. I think it's very artistic and very uh, atmospheric. And I think it's also very amusing. Like, again, I've seen this movie so many times, it's not scary at all anymore. And I feel that a lot of it is actually very funny and silly. And uh, I think that's kind of why I've come to like horror movies, actually. Um, I think when I was younger, I was very scared of anything horror, anything gory, anything uh, remotely scary. So I would t totally avoid any of that stuff. I wasn't that kind of kid. But uh, then I watched The Shining, which kind of showed me like how like artistic horror movies can be and made me realize like, oh, it's actually a really interesting thing and really like entertaining thing to like watch a piece of art that can make you feel like unsettled or like creeped out or scared uh make your skin crawl a little bit it's like a really interesting feeling and i think that's really cool about horror movies but also horror movies at the end of the day most of them are very silly if you just think about it like there's a great quote from jordan peele where he says the difference between horror and comedy is the music and i think that's so great because like yeah a lot of horror movies are super silly i mean there's a scene in the shining where a dude in a bear onesie is giving to a dude in a tuxedo. And the first time you watch it, it's like, it's super weird and like kind of scary at first. But <laughs> every time you see it afterwards, it's, it's like ridiculous. It's so funny. And because of that, The Shining has kind of morphed itself now that I've seen it so many times from a horror movie into kind of a comedy and it's kind of a weirdly a comfort film for me now but yeah the shining is great another great movie is spider-man into the spider-verse obviously the visuals are incredible uh they kind of revolutionized animation as we know it feature animation in particular um and the story against all odds i mean a story where like there's so many characters from so many universes all combined into one, they still manage to focus the story on Miles Morales and it doesn't feel jumbled at all, it doesn't feel overly bloated at all. It feels like Miles' story even though there's so many characters and cameos and stuff. And I think that's like the magic trick of this movie. Next up we have Star Wars A New Hope. Uh, this is my favorite Star Wars film. Uh, there was a time when I was super into Star Wars and I was like watching every movie and I was super excited for every movie, every like Disney era movie that was coming out in theaters. Uh, but then the last one came out, <laughs> The Rise of Skywalker. And that kind of uh, soured me on the entire franchise and I'm gonna be super honest. Star Wars, A New Hope though, I feel like is the original film. It's the George Lucas idea at its purest and it still like feels so original and so magical i ended up reading the uh making of star wars which is like a big like coffee table book uh and that made me appreciate this movie even more i just think it's a pretty phenomenal piece of world building obviously this first movie is imperfect but like it feels handmade you can feel the human touch you can feel the touch of the artists nowadays the star wars movies and tv shows are starting to feel like they're just coming out of a factory but this the original film still stands up in my opinion as like one of the greatest original science fiction fantasy fairy tale uh, movies of all time. All right, and to round out my film collection, we have two more movies, starting with Synecdoche, New York, which is a freaking insane movie. So this is the directorial debut of 
one Charlie Kaufman, who also wrote the screenplays of Adaptation, Being John Malkovich, and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which are all insane films. Uh, Charlie Kaufman is super good at like surrealism and like brain bending storytelling and also black comedy. Just to give you an idea, Synecdoche, New York is about a dude who is like a playwright and he's in New York and he decides to write a story, a play about New York City. So he builds, has a set of New York City built uh, in this one building in New York City. But the set itself is like life size somehow. And like all of his actors are portraying real people. And there's even a character in the movie that's portraying him as the playwright who's also writing a play within the play about New York. And it just kind of goes on from there. And it's, again, it's a crazy movie. It's uh, kind of depressing. It's about depression. Uh, but again, it's a black comedy. It's pretty funny as well. I feel like Charlie Kaufman is doing stuff in film that literally nobody else is doing and he's like making use of the medium of filmmaking and screenwriting in ways that like nobody else is thinking of and not to say that he, he like makes the greatest films ever but like he has like some of the most interesting ideas ever and I think a lot of people can like look at his movies and say oh they're super pretentious whatever uh, but I just think he's a super super interesting and intellectual filmmaker and I personally do love his movies. I think Snake to Key New York is maybe a masterpiece. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, Turn Your Brain Off movie, we got Wheels on Meals from Jackie Chan, uh, Sammo Hung, and Yuan Biao. A couple years ago, I was trying to get into kung fu films. I was watching movies from a bunch of different like actors and directors and stuff, but I ended up kind of, uh, kind of being basic and realizing that my favorite movies in this genre are Jackie Chan movies. I mean, he's the best to ever do it, I think, as far as these movies go. Uh, they're so entertaining. Uh, but for my money, Jackie Chan's best movies are the ones that he did with Sammo Hung and Yuan Biao. And they've only made three movies together. One of them is Wheels on Meals, which is my favorite of them. There's also Dragons Forever, which is also a ton of fun. And there's also the movie Project A, which features them fighting pirates as sailors, which is awesome. But yeah, this is such a fun movie. Uh, a lot of comedy, a lot of cool, crazy stunts. Yuan Biao jumps out of a balcony and lands on concrete on his ass in, a, in one of the scenes. And it's insane. <laughs> Check this movie out. Okay, so let's move on to my games. Obviously, I don't have a huge game collection. I just have a handful of Switch games and that's it. There was a time when I was a lot more into video games than I am right now. But uh, right now, I just can't really find the time for video games. I feel like a lot of my free time, I'd rather spend watching anime or movies. When I do find time to play video games, these are the games I play. Starting with Animal Crossing New Horizons. Obviously, like a lot of other people, I got addicted to this during the pandemic. And it's still uh, the game I've put the most hours into in my entire life. Uh, moving on, we have Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory. Uh, I was a huge, huge fan of Kingdom Hearts growing up. Uh, the last game I played besides Melody of Memory was Kingdom Hearts 3. It's harder for me to keep up with Kingdom Hearts nowadays because a lot of the story is in the mobile games and I don't play mobile games at all. Uh, it's it's hard for me to like still like be super duper excited and uh, passionate about Kingdom Hearts nowadays. Uh, but I still am excited for Kingdom Hearts 4 whenever that comes out or we get in use of that. Moving on, we got The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Tears in the Kingdom. Great games. Uh, these also I put a lot of hours into. I have loved these games. Uh, my Tears of the Kingdom uh, copy is digital only, so I don't have the physical copy here. All right, moving on, we have Skyward Sword HD. I unfortunately did not like this game very much. <laughs> Um, I don't know why. I think maybe I'm just too used to Breath of the Wild, the open world uh, version of Zelda now. But a game I do like, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. So one thing you need to know about me, I don't play a lot of games, and therefore I am horrible at most games. But Mario Kart, and particularly Mario Kart 8 and 7, I'm pretty good at. Um, maybe that's overestimating myself, but uh, I think 
I'm not bad at Mario Kart. Then we have the Pokemon Switch games. We got Legends Arceus. Uh, some interesting ideas in there. Pokemon Shield, pretty disappointing game. Pokemon Violet, pretty fun game, but wow, this game was like completely broken. <laughs> Glitches everywhere. I am shocked that Nintendo let the Pokemon company release this game in the state and also never patched it. So uh, moving on, we got Ring Fit Adventure. I was pretty into this for a while. Then we have Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. Never beat this game, but I had, a, had fun playing it with my brother. Uh, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate uh, is one of those games that I'm horrible at. And then finally, Super Mario Odyssey. A lot of fun. Excited to see what Nintendo has next in store for their uh, next console. But uh, until then, let's move on to my CDs. Starting with some uh, Blu-ray sized CD packages. We got Freerun, the original soundtrack by Evan Call. Freerun was one of my favorite anime of last year. Uh, well, I guess this year as well, since it ended this year. Um, but uh, the soundtrack was easily one of the standout aspects of it. So I had to get it uh, when it came out. Next up we have Otto Mars. Uh, yeah, I'm a big Otto fan. I actually got to see her perform live in Los Angeles earlier this year, and that was pretty awesome. So I decided to buy uh, a Blu-ray from one of her other concerts. This one, this one was in Japan, I think. But yeah, Otto, definitely one of my favorite singers in Japan right now. I just think she has an incredible range of vocal expression. And I also have two of her CDs. We have Utana Uta, the One Piece film Red CD, which is how I uh, discovered her in the first place. And then we have the Utatte Mita album, uh, which is basically her cover album. Uh, and from that cover album, I also have this uh, acrylic standee with some blue roses in the back, which is her uh, symbol. And then we have JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Golden Wind OST. This was a gift from my brother. Uh, this has Il Vento Doro, which is the famous Giorno theme, and also has the Torture Dance song, which is also pretty iconic. Then we have One Piece film, sorry, One Piece 15th anniversary best album. So this is a collection of, I think like the first like 15 openings, first 10 or so endings, and some other like extra songs. Uh, but uh, yeah, the first seven openings of One Piece are some of my favorite Annie songs of all time. And then to round out my CD collection, I do have more music uh, kind of in other parts of my shelf, but to round out this section, we have A Long Vacation by Eiichi Otaki, who is a uh, city pop artist. But yeah, let's move on to the beginning of my manga collection. So first up, we have Dr. Slump volumes 1 and 2, and Dragon Ball volumes 1 through 17. Uh, I have volume 3 of Dr. Slump on my desk. Uh, but yeah, I grew up reading Dragon Ball and Dr. Slump in English. These are obviously the Japanese volumes. Uh, but yeah, very, very nostalgic series. On to the next shelf. Alright, so this shelf starts off with Steel Ball Run, volumes 1 through 16 uh, in the Bunkuban edition. So that is all of Steel Ball Run. This is my favorite part of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, part 7. Uh, I'm very excited for the anime to eventually come out. It's been two years, I think, right? Since part 6, Stone Ocean anime ended. So hopefully sometime in the next year or so we get an announcement for, for Steel Ball Run. Ginga Tetsuo 39. I talked about uh, Galaxy Express 39 uh, up in my uh, Blu-ray shelf up there. This is the manga. So this is the first volume of the manga, of course, again, in the Bunkoban edition. Uh, cool, fun fact. So I bought this at a bookstore uh, in Nerima Ward in Tokyo, uh, near a station called Oizumi Gakuen Station. Uh, and Nerima is the city where a bunch of manga artists and animators all like worked, including the author of Galaxy Express 39, Matsumoto Reiji. Uh, he spent most of his career in Nerima. And if you go to Oizumi Gakuen Station, 
there is a bunch of Galaxy Express 39 stuff. There's a statue of the Conductor, there's a statue of Maytel and Tetsuro, uh, and there's like a big Galaxy Express 39 billboard. At least there was when I was there. So it's like, it's kind of the place for Galaxy Express 39. Uh, so it felt very, very appropriate for me uh, when we found that bookstore nearby to just buy a volume of Galaxy Express 39. And it's a, it's a fun series. Uh, next up we have, this is actually not a manga, but uh, we have the Godzilla Zen Kaiju Daizukan, the picture book of Godzilla's all monsters. So it's kind of cataloging every monster and every movie in the Godzilla franchise uh, from the beginning all the way up to, I think, Shin Godzilla is the most recent movie this, this uh, features, so it's not totally up to date. Uh, but it also includes American films as well. And we got Komi-san wa Komi-shou desu, or Komi Can't Communicate. Pull out one of these volumes. Uh, I was huge into this series for a little bit. Uh, basically right after the uh, first core aired of the anime, I got really into the manga. I started reading it. I was reading it a lot. I was basically like, every week I would buy another volume of, of Komi-san because I kept, I couldn't stop reading it. It was so entertaining. Uh, I really like Komi-san because it kind of depicts social anxiety in a way that's different from most manga or anime about characters with social anxiety. And there's no one correct way to depict it, but I appreciate in this manga that it's treated as something that's just kind of a charming trait that people have. I appreciate this manga for depicting not just social anxiety, but like all a, a lot of different types of anxiety uh, through all of its characters. Uh, anyway, I think this manga is great up till 24, up till volume 24. So if you have watched the anime, you can start from I think volume 10 and go up to volume 24. That depicts Komi's second year of high school. I love this part of the manga. I think it's so well done, it's so well written, it's very funny, uh, but also the character writing is great. After that, 20 volume 25 starts Komi-san's third year of high school and I think it kind of loses the plot and starting from here it kind of just devolves into a pure comedy without a ton of character development in each volume. I haven't been a huge fan of these last several volumes which is why I kind of stopped here. Uh, I think they're on like volume 32 or 33 by now but I stopped buying it because I just haven't really been enjoying it anymore. Uh, but I will still hold the first 24 volumes of Komi-san in a special place in my heart. I also forgot to mention I have the Komi official fan book as well, but uh, anyway. But next up, we got The Drops of God, volumes 1, 2, 3, and 4. I really, really love this series. It's kind of, uh, well, it's a wine tasting manga, but it also has like shown any aspects. There's a rival, there's competitions, um, there's like crazy reactions. It's very, very like manga-y and anime-y in a fun way. I didn't care at all about wine before I read the series and now I kind of like wine in real life uh, because of this series. This, this series is wine appreciation the manga. There is also a Apple TV Plus live action adaptation of this manga and I've watched it the entire season and it's different from the manga. They take it in a different direction and they kind of change the characters a bit but it actually is pretty good. Like genuinely it's actually, it's actually pretty good especially like the latter half of the season. First half of the season, I was like kind of on the fence about it because it was so different from the manga and I wasn't like totally sold on the differences, but I think they really figured it out in the second half of that series and turned it into an actually really great adaptation. Okay, moving on to the next shelf. So this shelf, we got My Chihaya Fudu volumes. We got volume one, two, three. And then 27 to 46. And then on my desk, I have volumes 47 to 50, which is the end of Chihaya Fudu. And uh, we, we talked about Chihaya Fudu earlier, the anime. So this is the manga. Uh, if you watch the anime, uh, seasons one, two, and three, and you completed all three seasons, I would recommend starting with volume 27 of the manga if you don't want to wait. Uh, indefinitely for a potential season four, which I obviously, as you can tell, I've already given up on. Uh, but uh, volume 27 actually kind of was adapted in season three of Chihaya Furu. Um, but it was 
like condensed a lot. Some of it is going to feel familiar to you, but uh, there's also some other content that I think is kind of important moving forward. So I also have the Jayafuru uh, official comic guide right there. And the official fan book. And then we have the Chayafuru anime guide. Then we have uh, another manga. We have Kalori Kalore Kriere, which is a manga by Amano Kozue, who I believe is the same author who wrote Arya and Amanchu. Uh, this is another like slice of life set in like a sci-fi fantasy world. It's about a teacher who goes to the houses of these little kids to teach them about the world and stuff. Uh, it's really cute, nice art, wholesome story, pretty good. Skip and Loafer, Volume 1, got that here. Uh, I have, to be honest, I have not read this volume, uh, but I bought this mainly uh, to support the anime, because uh, I really love the anime. Um, hopefully <laughs> it gets Season 2 at some point, but I'm not holding my breath. It seems like that's kind of the, the norm for anime that I end up liking. They don't usually get Season 2s, but uh, I really like the characters and the character development. So this is another like really great size of life, high school slice of life. Then we have probably a pretty um, obscure manga that no one has heard of. If you have heard of this, please let me know in the comments. Um, but this is a manga called Amber Days and Golden Nights, or Kohaku no Yume de Yoimasho. So I believe what this was about was this person is like an advertisement designer or something. This guy is a photographer and this guy just opened like his own bar selling craft beer. Uh, and so they kind of team up to like help him get business or something along those lines. Uh, I thought this was a pretty nice manga. It teaches you about Japanese craft beer. Uh, I found this in Japan. And something that you got to know about manga shopping in Japan, if you've never done it, go to any bookstore in Japan and they will have more manga than you could ever possibly imagine. And it will open your eyes to just how much manga exists and how much of it never makes it across the ocean. <laughs> so if you have the ability to read Japanese or you're studying Japanese, if you go to Japan, I would challenge you to go to a Japanese bookstore and browse not just the sections of the manga that you recognize, but like look at the other shelves and just pick up a manga that looks interesting or seems interesting, even if you've never heard of it. Uh, that's what I did for this. I, I picked up a couple other uh, manga like that in Japan uh, while I was there last year, and I didn't end up liking a bunch of them, to be honest. Uh, but this is one of the ones that I did like. All right, so next up we have Bakuman. Bakuman was a very, very influential manga to me as a kid. Uh, it inspired me to try to draw a manga when I was in like elementary school and middle school. It got me to thinking more seriously about like making art as a career in the future. And also, less importantly, it also helped me understand how Shonen Jump as a magazine and a company worked. Um, I think, you know, this manga came out in like 2010 or something. So some of it is a little bit uh outdated now but it taught me a lot about how the actual like shonen jump editorial office worked back then what the awards were how manga could go from making one shots to doing serializations uh what goes into the process of like canceling series or green lighting series and also like how important are the reader surveys um nowadays obviously shonen jump is quite different um, they have the whole Shonen Jump Plus division now, which is completely online. But anyway, either way, I think uh, this series is kind of essential for anyone who's a fan of Shonen Jump and just wants to know what the inner workings of the magazine are uh, and how your favorite series get made and what's kind of like the behind the scenes of all of that. Uh, but on top of that, it's a nice slice of life um, drama story. Next up... A much more newer series. We got Don the Don, which a uh, cool thing is getting an anime this fall by Science Saru. Um, excited for that. I was reading Don the Don week weekly, but I fell off recently. It's a fun series. It's a kind of, you know, among all the other <laughs> Shonen Jump series about people fighting monsters. 
I feel like this does take a little bit of a different approach to it. The monsters are a lot more creative in like the types of things they can be uh, because they're both fighting aliens and spirits. And sometimes it gets even crazier than that. But I think the thing that stands out the most about this series is the art. I can't believe this is a, a weekly series because the art is so freaking detailed and almost every double page spread is just mind-blowing to look at. All right, we're gonna take another <laughs> nostalgia trip. Here we have Nisekoi Volume 1. So this is the very, very first Japanese manga that I read cover to cover. So this is my first big accomplishment um, when I was learning Japanese. I mean, I'm still learning Japanese, but when I was still like a beginner with Japanese, this is my first big accomplishment, reading this book from cover to cover. But yeah, uh, Nisekoi. Nisekoi is a classic, at this point, I, I guess, classic rom-com from Shonen Jump. Uh, I think it was pretty unique at the time, at least for me, because like sh the Shonen Jump rom-coms that I read growing up were Aizu, Ichigo 100%, and To Love Ru, which if you don't know anything about any of those, they are very fan service <laughs> Uh, so this was like kind of a big departure because it was not fan servicey uh, or not really at all and that was actually kind of refreshing at the time. And then we have Rudy Dragon which I mean I was just talking about like the, the Shonen Jump culture has changed. Not every series has to be a sports manga or a battle manga. Nowadays you can get away with this apparently because Rudy Dragon is just a cute high school slice of life that's like not exactly a romance and not even exactly a comedy. It's just kind of a chill series about a girl who realizes that, oh, she's actually half dragon. But yeah, so this series actually went on a really long hiatus because of the author's um, health issues. So for the longest time, this issue, this volume, volume one, was the only issue of, of Rudy Dragon uh, that existed. But now the manga is back, so we're gonna get volume two very soon. I'm excited for that. I have not been keeping up with the manga weekly or however often it comes out, uh, but I will be looking forward to when the next volume, volume two drops. All right, next up we have Shigatsu or Kimi no Uso or Your Lie in April. We kind of already talked about it earlier with the anime, but uh, there's the manga. Then we have Shingeki no Kyojin, Attack on Titan, volume 34, which is the final volume. Okay, and then we have the start of my One Piece collection, so we have uh, volumes 101 to 105 on this shelf. And then uh, we have Naruto. I think this is like a three in one volume. Maybe four in one. This kind of volume is like something that's common when you go to Japanese convenience stores and go to like the magazine section. Sometimes they'll have like some of the really popular manga series like Naruto. They'll make these like convenience store versions, which are like printed on cheaper paper, but they include more volumes per book uh, like this. I also have a couple of random little trinkets here. We have the Mach 5 and the Shooting Star from Speed Racer. And then in this wine glass with googly eyes, which is a reference to everything everywhere all at once, we have a baby dragon toy. We have a no face and we have, I uh, don't remember what these are called, but these are chicken spirits from uh, Spirited Away. So, there we go. Next shelf. First off, just to get these out of the way, we have my uh, Thousand Sunny model kit. And I also have the, uh, what, what are these called? Paper theater. This is the one paper theater that I own. But yeah, let's get to the manga here. So we have Bakuman, this time in English. All 20 volumes. And then we have Naruto, volumes 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, I guess I didn't really talk much about Naruto. Uh, but uh, yeah, obviously I grew up on Naruto. It was like the first big anime that I was really into. I was into it when I was in like first grade, which is maybe a little young for Naruto. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so those are the first four volumes. But anyway, we've got One Piece, uh, which is another series I've been into since I was a kid. Uh, I think I got into it after Naruto though. So we have volumes 85 to 95 in English. And then over here we have the Japanese volumes 90, 90, volume 90, all the way up to 100. And then we go down to the next shelf. These are the rest of my volumes. They're, they're stacked 
two volumes deep. So I believe I have volume one all the way to 43. And then in the back, it's, I guess, 44 to 84. So I have volumes one to 95 in English, and then volumes 90 to 105 in Japanese. And the only reason I kind of switched to Japanese is because I felt like, oh, the Wano arc kind of takes place in like feudal era Japan. So it kind of makes more sense to have it in Japanese. Um, so that's why I have that. Egghead is the current arc. So I'll probably start collecting the Egghead volumes in English uh, at some point, but uh, we'll see. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the bottom shelf. So this is my art book collection. Let's start from the end over here. We have Jojo Gogo, -Go, which is the Jojo Hirohiko Araki art book that compiles the art from uh, Phantom Blood all the way up to Vento Oreo, uh, and maybe a little bit of Stone Ocean, but I think it mainly focuses on Vento Oreo part five. And then I have Jojo Veller, which is the art book compiling everything all the way up to uh, Steel Ball Run. This focuses on Steel Ball Run, but it does contain a good chunk of like the early art from Jojolian, which is part eight of Jojo, which I have actually not read yet. <laughs> uh, so I'm a little behind on Jojo. Well, I guess a lot behind on Jojo because I haven't read Jojolian and I also haven't started uh, Jojo Lands, which is part nine, which is currently being serialized. But yeah, then we have the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, creating a champion. This is the uh, art book for that game, uh, which is awesome. And then we have Hayao Miyazaki from the Academy Museum. And then we have Attack on Titan, the final season, part two and the final chapters, key animation book. So as that name implies, this is the key animation book, key frame uh, collection for Second time, the final season part two, and both parts of the final chapters. Then we have One Piece Color Walk Compendium, East Blue to Sky Pia. Then uh, the second one, Water 7 to Paramount War, which I just want to point out something. <laughs> so this is One Piece Color Walk Compendium, Water 7 to Paramount War, right? So why does it have post time skip art on the cover? Like, that's kind of weird. Anyway, moving on, we got the art of Miyazaki's Spirited Away. I don't know why there's like a dirt line here or a scratch or something. I don't know. Uh, but there's that. Then we have the art of Kimitachi wa Kiruka, which is The Boy and the Heron. One of the greatest films I've seen in a long time. Right next to another one of the greatest films I've seen in a long time, which I've already talked about. Shin Evangelion Geki Joban, uh, otherwise known as Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0, Thrice Upon a Time. This is Groundwork of, which I think is just a Gainax slash Studio Kara slash Studio Trigger jargon for key animation book. Yeah, actually it says it right here. So animation, Gengashu, uh, Jolkan. So it's the first of two books of the animation Genga keyframe collections. Okay, then we have this book. We have Suzumiya Haruhi no Yutsu, the uh, melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, Mei Bamen Sengashu, so uh, famous scenes line drawing collection. So this is like kind of not the same as a, a keyframe collection because it's just the line drawings. They don't have like the, the uh, indicators for where the shadows and lights are on the characters, which is usually what you would see in a keyframe collection, uh, which kind of makes me think maybe these are layouts, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Then we have Naruto Collector. This is uh, a magazine that Viz Media published, I think uh, quarterly, uh, that is just like a Naruto fan magazine that just has uh, stuff about, let's see, the, the, uh, the ninja, the anime, the creator, the cars, the video games, the jutsu, figures and toys, comics and stuff, or clothes and stuff. But yeah, so this is an interesting piece of 2000s anime culture in uh, North America, or at least the United States. Then we have Dragon Ball, A Visual History by Akira Toriyama. You have three Kaiju no Kodomo art books. So uh, this is kind of interesting because 
Japanese art books come in a, diff a couple of different varieties. Like in America, when you have the art of books, right? The art of Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, the art of Shrek 3 or whatever, the art of Mulan. It's usually just one book featuring art from every department of that movie's production. But uh, for Japan, a lot of the time they'll, let, they'll make like multiple art books for a specific given movie or TV show. And each of those art books focuses on a different discipline. So for example, we have, you know, these keyframe books, which is just the keyframes. It doesn't have like concept art or storyboards or anything. Same thing for this Evangelion one. The Ghibli art books are a little bit more all encompassing, but even those are split up between the art of books and we'll get to it later, but the storyboard books. So for Kaiju no Koromo or uh, uh, Children of the Sea, which is a movie I talked about earlier in this video. Uh, we have the art book, the uh, very vaguely named art book, which if you look inside is just, just background paintings. And the background paintings in this movie are freaking beautiful. So, I mean, no complaints there. But I, I did, when I bought this book, I did think this would be a more all encompassing art book. But no, it's just uh, the the background paintings, and then we have the uh, visual storybook, visual koshiki, which means official visual storybook. So this is kind of a it's less of an art book, more of just like a digest of the movie. There's like a synopsis. What else? There's interviews with the cast and staff. Some random bonus materials. There's a little bit of like sette, which is like uh, concept art, character design sheets. Um, we keep going. There's a little. There's a little sample of the storyboards. I do think. I think there's a storyboard book for this, for this movie, but I don't own that. Um, rough sketches. Genga. There's a little bit of Genga here. Keyframes, and just various little tidbits it's kind of like a magazine almost and there's like a bonus manga in the back uh, and then we have finally the uh, Genga Shu Kaiju no Konomo Genga Shu which again means keyframes book and yeah these are the keyframes which yeah this is an insane <laughs> movie just looking at these keyframes and how detailed they are there's this scene, which is just the main character running towards camera, which is insane. There's so many drawings there, uh, but yeah. Next up, we have Umakoshi Yoshihiko's Animation Genga Shu Dai Ikan, so book one, or The Animation Keyframe Arts of Yoshihiko Umakoshi, volume one. I bought this book back when I was really into My Hero Academia, uh, but this also includes his work on uh, Boku no Hero Academia, Mushishi, Cashier and Sins, and Ojamajo Doremi. So, if you're, a, if you're a fan of any of those, this is a pretty cool book to have. And this is also a Genga Shu, a key friends book. And then we have the uh, another book that's kind of specific to a specific animator. So that one, so this one was Yoshiko Umakoshi. This one is Imai Arifumi, who did a lot of the work on Attack on Titan, especially the first couple seasons. So this is the Attack on Titan Omnidirectional Mobility Animation Art Book, or Shingeki no Kyojin Ritai Kido Sengashu. Uh, so this is actually like a little bit different from a typical Gengashu, because this is not just the keyframes. This is this also includes in betweens, uh, because this is meant. For you to be able to flip through it like a flip book. I'm sure Attack on Titan fans will recognize some of these shots. So yeah, pretty cool resource for animators. All right, right next to it we have the first slam dunk resource. So this is actually another maybe exception to the rule. This is kind of an all-encompassing art book. For the movie, the first slam dunk. It also has uh, interviews and a bonus manga on the back. Uh, 
so that's actually, it's similar to, that's upside down, the uh, Kaiji no Konomo visual storybook. But next up we have uh, a little break from the art books. We have these uh, issues of Weekly Shonen Jump. The first two are uh, technically not real. These are like replicas. Uh, this is a replica of the issue where JoJo's Bizarre Adventure debuted. And then this is a replica of the issue where One Piece debuted. So the issue 34 from 1997 and issue 1-2 from 1987. Uh, so these replicas were like officially made by Shonen Jump Shueisha uh, to celebrate their like 50th anniversary or something uh, a couple years ago. I think like five, ten years ago. So these are kind of cool uh, collector's items. And then we have some real issues of Shonen Jump. First up, we have a 2011 issue that I actually did buy in 2011. Um, so this is a glimpse at the Shonen Jump manga that I grew up with. <laughs> so we have One Piece and Naruto, uh, Bleach and Bakuman, Skit Dan's Gintama, Kochikame, Beelzebub, Toriko, Reborn. Does anyone else remember Reborn? So that's that. Something I bought a long time ago. And then this issue of Shonen Jump. This is the very first issue that I bought the first night I was in Japan for the first time. So very special. The uh, 28th issue of 2019. Uh, yeah, pretty cool. And then next up we have Yamana Susume Next Summit Anime Guide. Uh, this is kind of another category of anime art books in Japan. This is uh, the anime guide slash fan book slash complete book. These are a couple of different names for those. So these usually have episode summaries, character model sheets, cast and staff interviews, character profiles. Um, and those are kind of the main things. And usually they have some random other bonus materials as well. But uh, yeah, uh, this is a cute anime, by the way, from uh, 2022. Uh, then we have the Kyoto Animation, Sakuga no Tebiki. So this is kind of the uh, Kyoto Animation uh, Beginner's Guide to Animation textbook. And then we have, uh, this is just kind of a random art book that uh, I was gifted. Fashion Illustration Book, The Art of Tanaka. Very cute stuff in this book. As you can see, if we move over here, we have my storyboard books. So this is uh, the Spirited Away complete storyboard book. And just to give you an idea of what it looks like inside, complete unabridged storyboards for Spirited Away, drawn by Hayao Miyazaki. So that's pretty cool. I kind of wish more anime made storyboard books. Uh, but I also have the storyboard book for The Boy and the Heron, or Kimitachi wa Doi Kiruka. And uh, this was a gift from a friend, a storyboard book for Senen Joyu, the uh, Satoshi Kon movie, which is pretty cool. And then I have this little acrylic art thing of the boy and the heron as well. And that's that shelf. Let's move on to the next one. All right, so this shelf is more art books, but also just other random books that didn't fit anywhere else. So we're gonna start over here with the Illusion of Life and the Animator Survival Kit, the two uh, required texts for all animators. Uh, then we have, let's see, one issue of Megami Magazine and one issue of New Type Magazine. Uh, Megami Magazine has San Euphonium on the cover, which is why I bought that from Fanime earlier this year. And New Type Magazine here, uh, you'll see it in my latest San Euphonium merch video. Uh, but this issue, even though it doesn't have San Euphonium on the cover, it does have a San Euphonium poster and like a short little article about Sound Euphonium 3 in it. Then we have Eguchi Hisashi's Animation Haike Genzushu. So this is uh, a uh, background artist or layout artist, I think, 
named Eguchi Hisashi, not to be confused with the Eguchi Hisashi who wrote uh, Stop Hibari-kun. <laughs> then we have uh, Glenn Vilpu's drawing manual, which I got uh, when I was in uh, university. Then we have The Golden Screen by uh, Jeff Yang, which is a book that kind of chronicles all the significant films in Asian American cinema. Uh, so everything from Everything Everywhere All at Once to Godzilla to Temple of Doom, Bruce Lee, Crazy Rich Asians, uh, and even going back to like some classic movies like, like Flower Drum Song and even movies starring Anna Mae Wong. So it's kind of a cool book for anyone interested in this topic. Uh, then we have some uh, N2 Japanese language profici proficiency test, JLPT textbooks. Uh, there was a point in time when I was trying to study for the N2 exam for JLPT, uh, but I didn't end up doing it. Then we have the first Berserk uh, hardcover. Um, <laughs> pretty, pretty cool. Uh, the art's really freaking good. Um, I tried to get into this manga last year, and I kind of fell off. But not because it, it wasn't good, but I just didn't, for whatever reason, quite hook me. I do want to give it another shot because it's so freaking highly praised. Uh, then we have uh, some new retro illustrations. So this is kind of like city pop vibe, 80s, and nostalgic illustration books uh, and then this is uh mid or clinical bus so this is like a little picture book that uh is about the studio ghibli short film may and the kitten bus which is a spin-off of my neighbor totoro that you can only see in the uh, ghibli museum in tokyo then we have a drawing anatomy book uh, and then we have this is higashimura akiko kanzen produce chosoku Manga Pose Shoe. So this is a manga pose reference book that was curated by Akiko Higashimura, who is the artist, the manga artist behind Princess Jellyfish, Tokyo Tarareba Girls, and uh, Blank Canvas, which is something we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but we also have Gendai Fashion Daizukan. So this is uh, another book about illustration, Japanese fashion illustration. Okay, then we have some like stuff up here. We have a Bunkaban set of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 5. So we open it up. It has all the volumes there. This is Japanese, of course. And then I have Karuta Senbe, so Karuta cookies, rice cookies, uh, matcha flavored that I got from Omi Jingu in Japan. All right, and then we have Blank Canvas, my so called artist during the entire all five volumes of the manga. Uh, really, really good manga. It's a, basically a autobiography from Higashimura Akiko. But I remember it really moved me and like almost every volume uh, made me tear up. And I feel like even though it's kind of about uh, someone who wants to go into art and become a manga artist, a lot of the lessons she learns can be applied to anybody who's like at the age of being in university or being a young adult so that's a high recommendation there and then we have uh, a novel english language uh, translation of haruki murakami's hard-boiled wonderland and the end of the world uh, this novel kind of blew my mind when i read it and then we have the kurosagi corpse delivery service volume one which is a pretty cool series manga series it's kind of like scooby-doo for adults we have a character who's a psychic, a character who's a dowsing expert, a character who's a hacker. Uh, and it's basically about this group of university students who like finds corpses and then is able to like talk to them using the, the psychic abilities um, and tries to like fulfill the corpse's last wish. And as you can imagine, it gets pretty dark and uh, gruesome. Speaking of dark and gruesome, we got Death Notes, all in one edition. Beautiful, beautiful book. And then finally we have my One Piece Viver card binder, which uh, for there was a minute where I was trying to collect Viver cards, but uh, I have since stopped <laughs> because it was getting too much. All right, so that's this shelf. Moving on to the next shelf. Okay, so this shelf we have, I'll start with the manga. We have Wotakoi, Love is Hard for Otaku, really cute uh, 
seinen slash yose series uh, i feel like romance manga featuring adults is kind of rare so this was kind of a nice uh breath of fresh air and also obviously a little bit relatable to me because because it's about otaku and then we have monster volumes one two and three by now kurosawa fantastic series it's very episodic but uh that's kind of by design 20th century boys if you thought monster was too episodic for you you should definitely definitely read 20th century boys because this is very serial and this is uh i would say one of the most exciting thrilling manga i've ever read it's so there's so many twists and turns it's so well written and so detailed great 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 series uh, i don't own all of it i only have volumes one through ten and i think there's two more volumes after that uh, but i will try to get those at some point <laughs> and then we have understanding comics and making comics by scott mcleod so these are uh, essential tools for well understanding and making comics so there you go and then we have uh, some toys up here we got my big Mach 5 and then I have two model kits here of Evangelions of course we got Eva unit 1 with his knife pretty cool and then Eva unit 0 with her gun but yeah that is that shelf moving on to these Okay, so these are my uh, special display shelves, which is why I would call them. So as you can see, we have a Bochi the Rock shelf, Chainsaw Man shelf, and two sound euphonium shelves. It used to be one, but I've been getting more and more sound euphonium stuff, so it's expanding up there. Uh, but yeah, let's start with the Bochi the Rock shelf, go through some of the items in here. So we have the Bochi the Rock uh, anime Koshiki Gairo book anime official guidebook we have this uh issue of Lis annie which is a uh, listen to animated music magazine that features bochi the rock on the cover we have the uh, blu-ray for bochi the rock season one uh, from crunchyroll and then we have volume one of the manga in japanese and then the original bochi the rock kesuga band cd and then down here so these are some, these flags I got from the Bocha de Rock uh, pop-up cafe, at the Tower Records cafe in Shibuya. And then we have the uh, Bocha de Rock acrylic standee that I got from the pop-up shop, also in Shibuya. And then these cards are from uh, wafers. So if you go to like your local Japanese supermarket, even in America, oftentimes there's, a, there's an aisle where you can find uh, wafers and gum and all and other like random treats that come with anime little anime goods like cards or sometimes buttons or stickers stuff like that so luckily my local Japanese supermarket had Bochi the Rock wafer cards uh, for a little while so I got to collect those uh, then we have a little Ikuyo acrylic standee from the uh, Tower Records cafe this is a deck of playing cards that features uh, Bochi's various funny faces on it. That was also from Tower Records Cafe. This is also from Tower Records Cafe. It's a it's a record. It's a vinyl record. Uh, what do you call this? Coaster. Coaster. And then we have a little acrylic of Ryo. And then down here, so these are uh, we have buttons and postcards from the pop-up cafe that, that has like the sleepover theme. Uh, then we have these guitar pick shaped keychains, some more Tower Records Cafe postcards, and then these two random big can badges from Ryo and Hitori. Uh, and then I have this little fan art sticker that came from some anime convention or something. And uh, actually, before we move on to the next shelf, uh, I did get another Bochi the Rock thing. Uh, so this is a can badge blind bag that comes with chewing gum. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Um, we can see the uh, can badge designs we can potentially get up there. Okay, we're on the floor here. Let's see what we got in here. Oof, 
Okay, so again, we can see all the different designs we can potentially get. Let's see which one <laughs> we actually got. Okay. Oh, nice. We got a Ryo. This one, Yamada Ryo B. Looks like she's in a tuxedo. Oh, and it's also a... So we <laughs> also get a little piece of gum there. But uh, I just realized this is also an embroidered cam badge. Not super common. So that's pretty cool. Ryo is my favorite character design-wise. So there we go. Now let's move on to the next shelf. So this is the Chainsaw Man shelf slash Tatsuki Fujimoto shelf. So obviously centerpiece here are all the books. We have 17 to 21 and 22 to 26. His two, Tatsuki Fujimoto's two one-shot collections. Those are obviously in Japanese. We also have Fire Punch volume one in Japanese. Uh, and then Chainsaw Man volumes one to 11. Buddy Stories, the light novel, Look Back, Sayonara Eddie, and then Chainsaw Man Part 2, which is volumes 12 to 17. And then we have Look Back and Goodbye Area in English, and then the Chainsaw Man uh, TV anime official starter guide. Okay, quick thoughts. <laughs> Goodbye Area and Look Back are easily Tatsuki Fujimoto's best work, um, but I do still love Part 1 of Chainsaw Man a lot. Uh, Fire Punch is freaking weird, and Chainsaw Man Part 2 is falling in the footsteps of Fire Punch. It's freaking weird. Um, and you could say the same thing about Part 1 of Chainsaw Man, but for me, Part 1 felt like it had a more structure to it, and I appreciated that more. But anyway, so here's all my Chainsaw Man merch. We have Makima's Dog Cookies, and we have my wall of stickers and keychains and charms and all that. I don't think I need to like explain each and every one of them, but you can uh, see them all. We have, oops, Makima, acrylic standee. I got Makima and her dogs, all her dogs. Got, got some pins here. Um, and there was some stickers. And these cards, I think were also from wafers like I was talking about with Bochi the Rock. And some more pins. And then this is a tag. I think this is a tag from the uh, Uniqlo collaboration. I have a couple of the Chainsaw Man Uniqlo shirts. And then this is the uh, sleeve that the that these stickers came in. But yeah, that is the Chainsaw Man shelf. Moving on to the Sound Euphonium shelf. Shelves. All right, so let's start up here. First up, we have my Sound Euphonium cap, which you guys might have seen in my previous Sound Euphonium videos including my pilgrimage video. It has the Sound Euphonium uh, title on the cover, on the front, and then on the side it has a little tubacun embroidered on there. And I put this uh, pin as well. Uh, this pin is from Chikai no Finale, so it shows Kanade and Kumiko. Then we move into this area. So in the back here, we have my Yatsuhashi box from Kyoto Tower. Uh, if you want to know more about that, check out my Japan uh, haul video from last summer. And then we have uh, some clear files for the third years, the second years, and the first years. These are all from Sound Euphonium Season 3. And up here, we got a Sound Euphonium Season 3, uh, what is this called? An acrylic plate, or it's a flat thing, uh, of Mayu and... Uh, Kumiko and over here we have some acrylic standees of Reina and Kumiko and in the back from season three and in the back we, we have another uh, pair of Reina and Kumiko acrylic standees from Liz and the Bluebird and I got these at the uh, Kyo Annie shop in Uji back in 2019 when it was still open so pretty cool um, now in the back behind the, the Yatsuhashi Yatsuhashi box and the clear files. We have some uh, vinyl albums. Uh, this, these are not related to Sound Euphonium. I just don't really have a great place to put them at the moment. But in the back there, I have Miki Matsubara's Who Are You album. Uh, I was a huge, huge Miki Matsubara fan back a couple years ago when I was really into city pop. Uh, still like Miki Matsubara, of course. Uh, Stay With Me is a classic. 
And then on this side, I have Cobalt Hour from Yumi Matsutoya or Yumi Arai. Uh, this is actually the, the album that uh, was my gateway into city pop because uh, I was listening to Rouge no Dengon, which is a song on this album. Uh, and Rouge no Dengon is the opening theme song for Kiki's Delivery Service. So uh, that was my gateway into city pop. And then behind that, we have a non city pop album. We have Utara Hikaru's One Last Kiss. This is obviously uh, the uh, theme song for Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0, which I've already talked about a couple times throughout this video. Uh, great movie, great album, great album cover with Asuka. So uh, yeah. All right, but let's move on down to the next shelf. So this is the main Hibike Euphonium, Sound Euphonium shelf. Uh, we have my books and media here. And then just a bunch of merch and decorations surrounding it. Let's start with the decorations and stuff. Starting with uh, the uh, chibi versions of the uh, clear file folders from season three, featuring the first years, the uh, third years, and the second years back here. I also have some ensemble contest uh, clear file folders here and here. This is a postcard set, I think from Ensemble Contest as well. And then we have all my can badges and button pins. These are coins or tokens from the uh, Kyoto Tower Hotel. Again, if you wanna know more, more about those, check out uh, my Japan haul video from last year. And then these button pins were also from the Kyo Annie shop in 2019 when that was still open. Uh, and then the rest of these pins or these can badges are from the KyoAni online store. This is from the KyoAni uh, Tower Hotel collab. It's like a metal coin thing. And I also have, of course, whoops, a Tubakun plushie uh, that has a strap on it. So you can put this on your bag just like uh, Kumiko does. Or I don't know, even your phone. Though I don't know how efficient that would be. In the back here, we got a cork board of a bunch of random stuff. Uh, it's a little messed up right now, but uh, we have the uh, wristband. Uh, we have film strip from Liz and the Bluebird, sticker from Liz and the Bluebird. We have the movie movie ticket card from Ensemble Contest in Japan. Some more Ensemble Contest postcards. We got a big acrylic keychain, uh, some tickets and cards from the Kyoto Tower Hotel, and then we have a shikishi illustration uh, here uh, from. I think I got that from eBay, but illustrated by Shoko Ikeda. Speaking of Shoko Ikeda, rest in peace, we have the first book over here, a character design backstage process for Sanifonium season one. This is a whole book detailing the whole like process of designing the characters uh, originally from the first season. Really interesting because they started off looking very different as you can tell. Um, but yeah, just to give a little bit of an overview of my books here, these are all art books or art adjacent books um as we talked about earlier japanese art books come in a lot of different varieties and types and almost all of those varieties or at least the most popular ones are represented here in these sound euphonium books so we have the uh, genga shoe or keyframes collection keyframes collection we have the uh dolga shoe the in-between book or flip book we have the sette shoe, uh, or official design works is how they uh, translate it. Official design works, sette shoe. Uh, we have the fan book slash complete books uh, over here. And uh, similar to those, we have the starter guide, anime starter guide. And we have a less common type of art book, but I've seen this uh, done for Evangelion, where this is an art book compiling the promotional art that they've done for this series uh, outside of what you see in the anime. So uh, including like events, goods, Blu-ray cover art, uh, magazine illustrations, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, let's go over all of them. So we have the character design book, which you just looked at. We also have the Sound Euphonium Season 1 official design works. So set teishu. So again, set teishu usually have like character model sheets, prop model sheets, background, uh, art, and line work, uh, concept art, stuff like that. So they're kind of like the general visual development uh, books for the anime. 
And then we have the Hibike Euphonium Season 2 Complete Book. And again, complete book basically just means fan book. And again, it's kind of weird because Japanese books, usually you, you, you think of Japanese books reading right to left. Uh, but I, I don't know, I guess for art books and magazines, they don't really care which direction. So some of these books are left to right, some of these are right to left. But this is the uh, complete book for Season 2. Uh, again, complete book just means fan book, so this includes like character profiles, episode summaries, uh, cast and staff interviews, uh, stuff like that. And then we have the uh, keyframe books or Gengashu for season two. So this is uh, split into two books. But we have Sound Euphonium Keyframes Collection, the first movement and the second movement. I'll just show you the first movement. And the second movement. And then we have the Liz and the Bluebird art book, starting with the set tissue, set tissue or official design works. And then the keyframes collection. And then we have the Chikaino Finale, or Our Promise a Brand New Day movie, official fan book. that's that and then we have the San Euphonium series illustration works birthday and movies again this is like promotional art for merch uh, events uh, collaboration stuff like that it's a pretty unique uh, again I don't see a lot of anime doing this specific type of art bugger the only one I know of is uh, Evangelion but I don't know maybe it's more common than I realize Then we have the ensemble contest animation flipbook so again, the difference between uh, the uh, animation flipbook and the Genga shoe is that this includes not just keyframes, but also in-betweens. And it's like uh, designed so you can actually like flip through the book and see the full animation. So it's pretty cool. Uh, then we have uh, on the Ensemble Contest Genga shoe. <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting that they made both a Dolga shoe and a Genga shoe for Ensemble Contest and they didn't make like a fan book or anything like that but whatever and then we have the starter book or starter guide for season three uh, so those are the main books that I have then we move into the media starting with the San Euphonium fifth anniversary disc Kirameki Passage so this is a drama CD which has some like bonus stories that take place mostly between Kumiko's second and third year of high school so if you're a fan of the anime and you want a little bit uh, more of like what happened between um chikaino finale and ensemble contest in season three maybe pick up this uh this uh drama cd or look it up online see what happened there there's some cute moments in these in these stories and they're fully voiced by the uh anime voice actors and have music and all that but uh yeah next up we have liz and the bluebird a movie so nice i bought it twice i'm sorry that was cringe but uh there's a cover there, and then we have San Euphonium Chikaino Finale, or Our Promise a Brand New Day. Uh, this is These are, again, the U.S. Blu-rays. Uh, I would really, really, really love for Crunchyroll or somebody to release Blu-rays for the seasons, seasons 1, 2, and 3. That'd be really great, but uh, we don't have that for now. I don't know if you can hear that, but they're mowing the lawn outside now, but... Uh, that's okay. Let's move on to the novel. We have the original Hibike Euphonium uh, light novel. So for the subtitle, Kitauji Koko Sui Gakpue Yokoso. Welcome to the Kitauji High School Wind Ensemble. Uh, this is the uh, first and since only <laughs> Japanese light novel I've actually read cover to cover because reading light novels is hard <laughs> for me. And then we have, this is uh, the uh, ensemble contest photo book. So this includes uh, the photos from the opening of Ensemble Contest. So that's pretty cute. By the way, if you want to know my like more in-depth thoughts about San Euphonium, how much I like San Euphonium, why I like San Euphonium, please check out my uh, San Euphonium pilgrimage video because I go into it there. Also, if you want to know more about uh, my thoughts on Bochi the Rock, uh, you can check out my top anime of 2022 video uh if you want to you can just skip to the end of the video where i talk about bochi the rock being my number one favorite anime of 2022 but uh more of my thoughts on this show are there so check that out 
But let's go back here to the CDs. So first up we have the Season 1 soundtrack, Omoide Music. Or Memory Music. And then we have the Season 2 soundtrack, Ongaku Endless, or Music Endless. And then this is getting a little messed up. But uh, we have the Chikai no Finale soundtrack, The Endless Melody. And these are all uh, by Akito Matsuda, except this one, which is the Liz and the Bluebird soundtrack, Girls Dance Staircase by Kensuke Ushio. And we finally have the uh, Ensemble Contest soundtrack, Catch Your Tone by Akito Matsuda. And I am currently waiting for the Season 3 soundtracks to come in the mail. Very excited to eventually add those to the collection. Oh yeah, wait, one more piece of media. We have the New Type magazine with Kumiko and Rain on the cover for Season 3. Oh, and speaking of Sanyaphonia merch, um, funny thing, literally while I was filming, I got a new package from, San from uh, Kyoto Animation. So uh, why don't we just open this right now? And box, and that is it. I only ordered one item this time, so let's open this up. Okay, here we go. Pretty nondescript box, but on the cover. Wow, <laughs> there's no, there's not like bubble wrap inside here, but I think it looks good. Be real careful. Oh, wow. Yeah, it came in good condition, thankfully. <laughs> but yeah, we got a, a mug cup. Really cute, has a treble clef as the handle. Uh, and on the bottom has the logo and the tubacun. This is from, this is merch originally from season one. They just recently uh, restocked it. But yeah, so we have all the main characters. We got Hazuki with her tuba, uh, Reina with her trumpet, Kumiko and her UFO, and uh, Sapphire with her contrabass. Yeah, really nice ceramic mug. Uh, I'll have to find a place for it, uh, but this is a piece of KyoAni merch, sound euphonia merch that I've been kind of wanting for a while and it's been out of stock on their website forever so i'm so glad that i finally got it oh yeah and in case you're wondering uh i believe this is a yeah this is a food safe like drink safe cup so it's not just like a piece of decoration uh but yeah let's return to the shelf and that my friends is all for that shelf uh, if you guys are interested in me doing like a full San Euphonia merch tour, this is actually not quite all that I own San Euphonia related. This is just kind of the main stuff. Um, but if you guys want me to do like a full on in-depth tour of every single thing in my San Euphonia collection, um, maybe let me know in the comments below. Maybe I'll just combine that with my next unboxing video. I do have more stuff coming in the mail later this year. Uh, so we're definitely going to do another unboxing of new San Euphonia merch and maybe I'll just uh, make an extra long video talking about every single thing I have in my collection. But with that, that is my entire shelf. So uh, I think we're going to end this video right here. Um, I'm also going to throw up some B-roll of some of the posters I have around. Uh, but uh, oh, actually... One one last thing, almost forgot. On my desk, I do have a couple more items. We have the rest of Chihaya Fuda because I'm trying to read through these. So volume 47, volume 47, 48, 49, and the final volume of Chihaya Fuda, volume 50. Um, we also have volume six of Yibisaki to Rennen, otherwise known as A Sign of Affection, which is uh, probably my favorite anime of winter 2024. I thought it was a very cute, uh, romance and cool that it's about college students instead of high school students and also cool that it's about a hard of hearing person or a deaf person and then we have Dr. Slump volume 3 uh, in Japanese and then we have the, the uh, recently released Sandland Kanzenban uh, that I bought kind of just 
in tribute to Akira Toriyama, rest in peace. And the last thing I have is this little cat close toy. Uh, but yeah, that's all that's on my desk. And with that, that's gonna be the end of the shelf tour. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm gonna go get myself a glass of water, but until I see you guys in the next video, have an awesome day. Except, just kidding, not the end of the video. Uh, so I'm actually in the middle of editing this video. It's been a couple weeks since I originally recorded and I got some more stuff and I wanna show you guys. So let's start over here. I got this Mau Mau figure from Apothecary Diaries. I just recently finished Apothecary Diaries. I kind of became obsessed with it. I'm, I fell in love with it. I love Mau Mau as a character and I just really wanted to have uh, either an acrylic standee or a figure uh, and I ended up finding this one. So there's my Mau Mau figure. Also from uh, my local Japanese supermarket, I got some more wafers. We have freer in wafers now at my Japanese supermarket. So I got uh, these cards from these wafer packs. Pretty cute. And uh, speaking of Japanese supermarket, I also got these stickers, this sticker, and this sticker for Bochi the Rock from some chewing gum packs. And of course, I also got some new sound euphonium stuff, but I actually don't want to talk about them right now because I already filmed an unboxing video. Uh, and I'm gonna be filming more unboxing videos for sound euphonium and, and then compiling them all together into one big unboxing video at the end of this year because I still have some sound euphonium merch on pre-order that's going to be coming later this year so yeah you guys with keen eyes who paid attention to this video can probably tell what are the new things i added uh but yeah again thank you so much this is the real end of the video thank you so much for watching this really really long video i know i didn't expect it to be over two hours but uh here we are um thank you so much for watching or listening if you actually stuck around this long if you like this video be sure to uh Hit the like button down below, the thumbs up button, subscribe if you want. Follow me on Twitter if you want to hear from me more often. Uh, but otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. Have an awesome day.